everybody, and thank you for joining the Adventures of Commercialization. Today, we have our topic of art in entrepreneurship. So as I said, in, not of entrepreneurship. And today we have um, Todd Kimball. Hi, Todd. Hello. How are you doing today, Zoe? I'm great. How are you? I am fantastic. Wonderful. Well, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what intrigued you to come on to our show, Art in Entrepreneurship, today? Um, absolutely. So I'm Todd Kimball. Um, my day job is working in technology, but I have also done a number of things over the years. Um, a couple of decades at Burning Man, I've worked and helped uh, like run a number of big art projects. Uh, I have also had a number of startups myself, including my current project, um, which is an entertainment company. And today, um, I just, I really wanted to, I like what you're doing, wanted to discuss the concept of where like art and entrepreneurship and like those pieces collide when it comes down to building things and funding things and kind of making passions happen. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And what an awesome array of serial entrepreneurship that you have worked on. Thanks for sharing. Um, so let's start at the beginning. So something that really intrigued me to take this topic on today was over the holidays, we heard a lot this year about, you know, um, shop local, uh, home, homemade, um, a lot of uh, small businesses. And I, I found that really intriguing because a lot of people over the pandemic, you know, had lost their jobs or went furloughed. So I was trying to see if there was a correlation between this increase in, um, you know, small businesses and, and home businesses and, you know, the, the decrease of, of time in the office. What do you think about that? Um, possibly. And honestly, I, I just, something popped into my head thinking about like what's happened with COVID and the past decade with Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and kind of the gig economy exploding, I'm wondering if now, you know, Etsy's already out there, maybe it's time for sort of like an equivalent of the gig economy, but you know, not at that same service-based level, but more of a, um, like a, a content, a providing um, like more than just, um, Kind of where things have been going, you know, that service base of, oh, I'm just like bringing you something or taking you somewhere versus like, providing actual products or things, um, you know, tends to be better for, for everyone, you know, for like yourself and kind of emotionally for like being fulfilled uh, as well as economically. And so it's kind of popped into my head thinking about, you know, that might be a direction to go. Um, and, you know, don't know that there's a whole lot out there to help build that currently. This is true. Um, I've heard about some great new startup companies, um, one that I'm actually currently working with that is trying to, to bridge that barrier between, you know, the service and providing that service, but also bringing some sort of, um, you know, home, home usage and, and wealth, welfare, you know, bringing that back in. I know that a lot of people could really use that since we've been stuck at home or working from home on screens all day. Like, how do we build that, that wellness factor back in there? Um, but Back on the, the subject of, you know, um, these small businesses and entrepreneurs and art in general, um, we see a lot of these, these uh, hobbies and skills, you know, really arts being turned into full-time jobs. And, and how, how do you think that companies go about starting something like that? Um, for me personally, it's the, the, the old concept of, you know, probably from a bumper sticker, real musicians have day jobs. And personally, for a lot of the art that I've done while I've worked with people who've done like, big art at Burning Man, who've got funded for it, my art has always been smaller and, you know, I funded it myself. So kind of dealt with my day job or kind of collaborated with a few people. Um, but, you know, there's a, a bit of a hurdle there, you know, getting from that, I'm kind of the garage musician or this garage, like just sort of a garage artist doing something small um, into getting the funding. And that's, you know, when it comes to Burning Man, you, you go and you can talk to Burning Man and you can get funding from them. That still covers about a third of what they expect. Um, and kind of getting out from the entrepreneurship side, there are 
some things out there. You have your kind of your angel investors and your VCs, but kind of bridging that gap. There's a lot going on there. Um, you know, it takes a little bit and kind of getting to that growth stage is weird and interesting too, especially with promotion and stuff, because on one hand, we have social networking and all these ways to get out and reach people. But on the other hand, um, it's very difficult from like the standpoint of, you know, both they're trying to make money and they have some algorithms that are favoring certain bigger audience stuff already. Um, but there's also a lot going on that people don't realize when it comes down to kind of like dealing with fraud and things. And when you've got people who are trying to build a business and people who are trying to build an illegitimate or, you know, a, uh, a fake business, those things can be very similar. Um, in, in a prior life, I worked, um, like I managed the risk and security of a large social network. So I have a lot of experience both with um, kind of meeting, like how people are meeting new people online, as well as kind of the darker elements. And it's a, uh, um, it's a hard place to navigate, especially when you, know, you don't know all those pieces. And, you know, you have these big corporations that are sort of faceless trying to point things a certain way. And so going about, you know, to get your art funded, for example, if you had, how do you think that they would start? If you're talking about getting funding off the internet, you said if you collabed with some friends, you know, it costs money to make money with that concept. We kind of understand that. But if we were going to go, say, to a GoFundMe or some more other types of, you know, seed investing, how, how does that work? Um, so, you know, right now, if I was going to, you know, with my company, I already have kind of a built in. So yeah, this is a new company that I'm actually just starting and incorporating. I have kind of a built in clientele, so I'm not worried about it at that level. But I'm also working with some friends who uh, are probably going to be doing a big art project at Burning Man this year. And they they make their living off art, but they're still, you know, they kind of they get the contracts from time to time. And I uh, I'm talking to them. There are things like Patreon, which I think are fantastic. Um, you know, I've taken the uh, like the old concept uh, of tithing of, you know, you, you set aside 10 percent of your income, uh, theoretically, that would go to the church. And I try and do the same where I take that. And because um, I'm lucky enough to have a day job that covers my expenses. And so I try and make those sorts of ties with things, things, things like Patreon, where I have artist friends who you know, they don't have the day job. They don't have that. Um, but then using things like that to help sort of build an audience. And that is, it's a really good option these days from the smaller level, um, from the art or kind of from the craft entrepreneurship level, when it comes down to like maybe more tech things. Um, I haven't dug into that space in a while, um, but it's still, it's also, it's a lot easier with some of the stuff now. Uh, Amazon makes it easy and relatively inexpensive to you know, at least get a proof of concept working so you can go and either start shopping it around or, um, you know, maybe get some set, something viral happening where people see it and people come to you um, versus 15 years ago where you needed half a million dollars just to kind of get something off the ground because you were paying for all the infrastructure to make the stuff work. Mm -hmm. And so if you were going to go about getting a organization or an event to fund, for example, Burning Man, do the, does that money come out of ticket sales or where, where are they getting that money from? Oh, uh, yes. Burning Man, um, they have, oh, I believe it's the Ember Report. Uh, they've even before they became a nonprofit, they've been very open about um, uh, their money and they, they like they rarely actually take any money out of the event. Um, but it's uh, they, you know, the ticket sales go primarily towards uh, the BLM and like leasing the land. Um, and then at this point, it's been a couple years. The last time I remember, it was something like, I don't even remember the event numbers, but they were doing something like $250,000 a year in art grants year round. So outside of the event um, for art grants, but then Burning Man itself, it's, it's like most grant processes. They're, you know, a nonprofit, a lot of nonprofits do grants. And so you, um, you know, you, you write your pits to them and you contact them. And so if you want to get uh, funding from Burning Man for the event, um, you know, they've got a process you go through. And from what I've heard, it tends to do better if you can tie in the art that you're doing with the theme of the year. Um, but it's also, there's still, they will only pay about a third of what they expect um, the budget to be. So it's still a lot comes down to the artist to make sure they um, can make up the rest. And it's also a lot easier now. You have GoFundMe, you have Patreon, 
Um, you have these other options. When I was, you know, the last time I was involved with a really big art piece, these things weren't um, available yet. And the primary artists would, um, you know, all their income for a year would go towards doing these big pieces um, just hey, so there. they could. Yeah, and so on that note, uh, how, what about the, you know, you were talking about a little bit the security on the internet, you know, giving out your concept or idea, if we look a little bit further, you know, of proof of concept for, um, let's say, an invention or, you know, an experience, something um, innovative, but also a little, little bit away from, you know, sculptures and, and paintings. But how how do you think that that is so secure, putting it up on a website like GoFundMe or patrons? And, and where... Where does the line draw between your creative state and you know being in the hot you know hot zone for for somebody stealing your ideas? Like how does that um, work? And that's a tough one. And like part of it is um, kind of the the eighty twenty rule, where kind of like share eighty percent, but keep the twenty percent of the magic to yourself. Um, and it also a lot depends on what you're doing. If it's something that you can trademark or copyright. Uh, and I, like a lot of my experience at Burning Man has been uh, like volunteering with the legal team and actually with attorneys out there and kind of seeing how those things go. Um, and while, you know, a lot of attorneys get a bad rap, there are some that I feel like didn't do so well in the consuming their own young <laughs> classes at school, but um, they're uh, like having good legal representation at different levels um, is important for some of these things. So like I would always advocate, you know, if you have the ability to go uh, talk to someone uh, who's done this before or ideally kind of get involved with someone um, who you can trust. Uh, but yeah, that's a risk. If you are doing products, uh, a lot of like the Kickstarter stuff where they're building products and they get that money ahead of time, um, you know, you're going to have like groups in China um, and like even Amazon um, will take those things and kind of run with it. Um, and from that standpoint, from the product standpoint, if it's something you're gonna like mass produce and sell, um, you know, I would take the kind of the concept of, right, I'm gonna make some money off of this, but kind of once again, that serial entrepreneurship, you know, have some other things lined up. Um, and, like kind of that long tail that my personally I kind of like the, the fail fast concept where kind of you do these smaller things and um you know maybe you get some success off of them um but then roll with it but you know my personal you know personally it's also been you know I've been lucky enough to have a good day job and so um I use that to to take care of myself um but yeah it's uh that is a now I'm rambling but yeah that's it it's a, a very real sort of a um, like an issue and a concept. So especially in the early stages, be careful who you share it with um, and, you know, honestly, how you share it. Yes, I think the statistic is what two out of three little startups will will not succeed within several months. I think it's within the first year we'll we'll not see um, we'll kind of see that it's not going to be going anywhere, which is kind of a scary fact, you know, I, I but I do think that some of these um, smaller businesses and these these websites and opportunities are creating um, entrepreneurs out of everyday people, especially with this extra time that they have on their hands. Like, um, people that were stay-at-home moms sewing are becoming serial <laughs> entrepreneurs and they don't even know how to market themselves. A lot of uh, females that are doing, I want to say, uh, fashion, which I definitely think is an art um, of sewing, and, and they're creating these Etsy's and these Instagrams that are just blowing up. Up and, and getting so, so much interest. Um, how do you think about marketing yourself in something like that? So do, is, is Instagram and Facebook, is that, is, are there paid in the background that, that really promote those small businesses? Is that needed? What kind of a presence does a small person have to have? You know, that's a lot of the, like on one hand, my day job, I, I work for a, a travel advertising company, but um, like I don't deal with that directly, but that's one of those things. If you know you kind of need to be a, a jack or Jill of all trades and kind of look into both. Okay, I'm creating this thing, or maybe partner with someone and take a look at um, kind of the different platforms. Think about who might want your product, what platforms would they be on, um, and start looking at um, may, maybe throwing a little bit of money at some of the targeted advertising there. 
Um, and I actually, I want to go back. I thought of something in regards to um, kind of the, the growth and like providing some of the tools for these things for people who are in the United States. Um, the SBA, so the Small Business Association, has this thing. I forget what the acronym acronym ah, ah, yeah, acronym. It's the SBDC, which goes through a lot of community colleges and stuff. Uh, my father actually worked, uh, did consulting work with them for a number of years, and they provide, I don't know, it's an hour a week or an hour a month from people with different disciplines. My father uh, has his MBA and would come out and help these small businesses with their uh, their financials, and so you know they understand their their profit loss statement, those sorts of things. But these are free resources that the government provides, where you can go um, and you have these professionals that it would be a a trusted source where you can go and you can get help with financial stuff, help with marketing stuff, um, and maybe even to the point of um, you know they can advise you. And the the government, the SBA, still does provide uh, a lot of loans for small businesses, um, and I think it's something like. 80% of small businesses fail within the first five years. Yep. Okay. Um, and yeah, there's a big, but that's a, that is a, like I they had totally forgotten about it, but there's a big resource that's available to people um, and it's free where you can go and, you know, you don't need to know everything. Um, you know, you can have this and, you know, they can help bring some other people in. That's wonderful. That is such a great resource that I did not know about. So yes, for small businesses, I will keep that in mind. I got to tell a couple people. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, yeah, but circling back to a little bit more of just like art and, and, and I guess the legality around art, like what is, I mean, art is in the eye of the beholder. So the, the cost of art can, can vary depending on, you know, who's selling it, you know, how long they've been in the business, if they're alive, if they're dead. <laughs> um, and just like, what is an intellectual property of art? Is there, is there a definition or is that just really vague? Is it own a concept? You know. I know people who, who say, low glass and have a specific type, um, you know, Chihuly um, in Washington has a very specific way that they do things, but is that, is that ownable? Um, so it kind of depends, like with your standard art, you've uh, kind of traditional things where you've got say paintings or photography or um, like music or writing, uh, you can copyright all of that. And so, you know, I, I haven't looked into this in years. I used to be a professional photographer, but um, most of it was wedding photography. So we would kind of sign over the copyright. That was, you know, one of the things you know, we weren't trying to nickel and dime the brides. It's like, okay, you paid us for this. We want you to have the pictures. Um, and so you can copyright those things and get it out there. So if people take it, it gives you some recourse. Once again, um, it's still going to require attorneys. Um, then you have the option of trademarks, which is normally just kind of like your, your, your business, your logos and things. Um, you can also patent processes. So with things like the glass blowing, if they're doing it in a certain way, um, the, the, you know, if it's, it's a new and innovative, they can probably document that. And once again, I'm not an attorney. Um, I have to call in some people who um, I know who do this, but they might be able to patent some of those processes. Um, you know, and manufacturing processes, if you are, you know, maybe it's fashion or something like that, you can, you can copyright it, you can might be able to patent some of those processes if you're doing it in a new and different way. Um, and like, as far as like, what's going on with art, the NFT stuff exploding these days, too, which, like, I see some ways that it can be used for, um, like some digital content that might work uh, like across games and things like that, but there's also just a whole lot of speculation, um, which you know people are making loads of money in can, but uh, I tend to be a, a bit too conservative to get in it at that level. Um, uh, but you know there's a lot with that, if, especially if you're doing digital creations, um, where that theoretically could give you some protections, where you create an NFT of this art piece, and even if it gets copied. Um, what I haven't looked into is tying that into like, actual uh, like physical items, which might be an option as well. So, um, you know, the concept of the scarcity or like verifying that this 
like amazing dress or piece of art or blown glass, um, you know, actually came from this artist, um, you know, might be a way of handling some of those things. And you do production and music as well, don't you? Uh, yes. Perfect. And and how how does that work? So, for example, DJs nowadays they're they're mixing other people's music and calling it their own. I, I, there's copyrights out there for that, but how how does that work? Um, so, like, I don't actually do. I'm a DJ. I don't do any production right now. But uh, if I were going to, um, and this goes back, and it goes a lot into it. Uh, Hulu has a really good series on Wu Tang Clan, and so you've got kind of the early '90s hip hop, like the like the beginning of hip hop until the early '90s. Uh, it was the Wild West because a lot of this was new, and so the there was a lot of litigation. But back then, you could take pretty much anything and sample it um, and and run with it. And when hip hop was new, nobody was looking at it. Um, the corporations, like the music industry. Uh, like didn't really care, but then they started making money off of it and they came back and, oh, we own these things. So if you wanted to remix something, um, you know, you have to go and, you know, you need to get permission, you need to license it. There are some leniencies if it comes to satire. Like Weird Al technically doesn't need to, um, doesn't need to license or get permission for, at least I don't believe he does. It's, there's some weirdness with lyrics versus music. But because that's parody, he doesn't need to get permission to do what he does. But um, to the best of my knowledge, like everything that he has parodied, he has gotten permission from the original artist. Okay, awesome. Um, that's great that the original artist is getting, you know, recognized because I think as, as we, you know, more and more art comes out there and, you know, we share ideas of different designs for fashion or, you know, um, different ways of blowing glass. It's, it's, it continues to evolve with each person, but, but who own, you know, where's the original and like how, where did that idea really come from? And, and we know that with patents and copyrights and things like that, there's, there's really a, a tangible hold on, on the ownership of it. But when it comes to a lot of other art, um, I just wondering how these entrepreneurs are keeping it, you know, keeping it there is, which is just, and, and the art is definitely the, beginning it's the core this passion the drives these entrepreneurs to you know when they had a little bit of extra free time or some extra free space that they made up in their house over covid by rearranging some rooms it, it sparked that you know ign ignition inside of them to to follow their passions and to really become um, a little bit more in tune with one of their skills or hobbies and and find out that they could make a profit off of it. And, and with everybody on their computers and all this accessibility to the internet and all of these, you know, websites that we are able to be on, it's and marketing you can do by yourself for free on social media. It just creates entrepreneurs out of every single, you know, household anybody like yeah it, it's it's amazing how um wide the range has um be, has become with this amount of people and this amount of accessibility and you know this extra time and space so i'm uh, i'm excited to see about you know just more businesses that pop up but i also worry about them just keeping um you know it in in to be their own if that makes sense so um we talked a little bit about, you know, patents and, and, and copyrights. Um, and I'm thinking just a little bit more about, um, because we're running out of time here, just <laughs> what other, you know, art, art that, um, in, entre in entrepreneurship we can think of. Um, and so like when it comes to the building, you know, a lot of this for me, a lot of the, the, like I, didn't ever think I could be an artist, um, but Burning Man changed me. Um, and a lot of these things, like if you're building it, like community is important. If you can get out there and, you know, you have like whatever this is that you're passionate about, that you're creating, um, that you can get people involved with. And if there are people that are doing, you, you put together like symbiotic relationships where, you know, maybe somebody is doing these great hats and you're doing maybe skirts or, you know, the 
kind of the cool like ruffle belts for festivals and um you can kind of like work together and like build communities together um then you've got that word of mouth and even if stuff is taken um you know you still have kind of that base level of you know you're doing your passion you're doing something you love you're providing something and um you know that in my mind goes a long way towards you know people coming back to you um like an example of that is uh my friend autumn um has built this huge company now but uh, dark garden corsetry and you know i know her from uh, like 30 years ago um she would go to these small little like i met her at this world war ii festival and we ended up like taking a swing dance cl class together um and she started this business and now um like Eda Von Tees is friends with her because she's gotten and she's done custom corsets uh, um, and, and other stuff like that, but just because she's been very passionate about it and stuck with it. And there are lots of companies that do corsets and other things, but you know, she does this amazing work and has been able to grow this company and like, build a community around it as well as um, you know, provide, I don't know, she probably has at least a dozen people working for her. Um, and it's, you know, it's a network, similar sort of thing. I feel so much of that networking is a very big part of this. You know, we and and although we have social media and we have all of these resources, um, as you mentioned, collaboration and networking and passion behind that uh, type, you know, about what you do and that really showing through your work and and the people that you meet to to move forward with. I think um, that's definitely um, where you get the next stage of your funding. We, um, as we were going to talk in future episodes about angel investment funding, VC funding, and a lot of the other ways that you can receive um you know more money for your business without actually spending more money yourself <laughs> because <laughs> um you're kind of you know start trying to quit your day job so that you can actually pursue this as an actual you know full-time position for yourself i think the networking aspect is really that next step um you know you've got you've you've harnessed the idea into a spark of spirit and passion to take you to this you know just taking you in the right direction away from maybe you know sitting in a cubicle which you weren't always that happy with taking covid as a uh, or being locked down as a blessing in disguise and more um, using it to your advantage and using the internet to help network and push your ideas out to the world. I think that that is really um, the next the next step and the next episodes that are coming up. So I'm, ex <laughs> I'm excited to, to see where these companies go and how, how they move forward even further from this. Um, I'm excited too. And I'll say, you know, it kind of starts at home, support your friends and, you know, they'll come back and support you too. I do believe that. And that is, again, bringing us back to what I said at the beginning of this show. I just think that it is so valuable and, and inspiring that this year we have really, I just saw it on any person that I met, you know, shop local, you know, shop handmade, shop small businesses. And I think that we should continue to do that for each other. Let's continue to rally behind our friends and families and, and local businesses. Um, the ones who, you know, made it through the pandemic, you know, kudos to them. I'm so proud of them. I supported as many little restaurants that were shut down with as I could because I wanted to see them come back after after COVID. And I and I continue to try and do that as much as I can. A lot. Thank you so much for having me, Zoe. This has been a pleasure. Thank you too. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, that was art in uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, we'll see you next time for adventures and commercialization in two weeks. <laughs>